Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the CRM Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management archaeology and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast episode 289, hosting on May 28th, 2024. I'm your host just for today, Heather McDaniel McDevitt. And joining me are Doug in Scotland. Everyone. Andrew in Southern California. Hey guys, how's it going? And uh, Bill is off gallivanting and so is Chris, so they won't be joining us today. But today we are, the three of us, going to be talking about... Is it true, in general, is it true that archaeologists are grossly underpaid across the board? Is there a current opportunity for fair compensation right now in the marketplace? Not that we're going to create, but does fair compensation actually occur in the marketplace right now? Where is that, generally? And then, in general, what does commensurate with experience really mean? And these are, we're going to have our three segments like we typically do and we're just going to go from there so i think we'll we'll start segment one the impetus behind this podcast was bill sent us who's not here but he sent us a post that and i don't know really where he got it from but it's a it's a poster that is on a glass for panda express and it talks about it says earn grow and thrive And then it says, discover your career path to $100,000. And then it has kind of a stair step. And we'll put this in the show notes. But it has a stair step where you start in the service area and the service and kitchen team at $40,000. And then you progressively move to a shift leader cook at $48,000, assistant manager at $77,000, and then a store general manager at $100,000. So, not that we're going to just focus on Pan Express, we're not, but this is an impetus for us to discuss, number one, these memes that we see a lot. I think people put, because I mean, not that memes are wrong or bad, but I do think they can be very misleading if people are putting more stake in them than they should be. So, you know, you have something like this, it's very incendiary, it's, it's very shocking, you know, I'm... I have a bachelor's degree or even a graduate degree of some sort. I'm working my butt off in the field and I'm not making anywhere near any, anywhere near these amounts, even from the bottom, right? That's what people are saying. So you see this a lot. Should I just go and work for fast food, you know, workers? And so, but there's a lot of components of this that people are not, are not really considering. And I think that I understand people should be fighting for just better wages, better benefits, better treatment, better professional opportunities. But without a clear, for you personally, we can't control, nobody can control it across the board. We can't, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to, you can try to make things better. That's for sure. But for somebody who's starting in the market, and that's really the people that are affected, I think, most, you need to control what you can control. And that is by really understanding what these memes, you know, do they hold any weight? Is there, is it truly true that you cannot make good money in archaeology? And if you can, how can you get to that? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's see, Andrew and, and Doug, do you have anything you want to say to start off with? I was just going to add some more context. So, that that Panda Express is from California. Oh, thank you, dude. Yeah, and part of it, and I think this this is one of the things that 
good thing to discuss, especially when people talk about like, you know, how much we should be making as archaeologists. You know, California just passed a new law for fast food, fast workers. food workers. That is, you know, different uh, different laws affect that that bottom weight rate. But actually, and this is the things like everyone sees these amounts and no one really actually investigates a little bit further. So like even on that sign, there's like a little asterisk mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. that's talking about like total compensation. And right. actually like that's sort of an, an average. And there's like a lot of legal text down there saying like, you know, Panda Express makes no guarantee that you'll actually make this money. <laughs> and, 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 even then, and everything else makes, yeah. 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 But even then, like that's actually not like 40K is actually not the California minimum wage for fast food workers. It's actually right. under it. So you're, you're not actually, you're not actually working your, your, your 40 hours a week. And again, it's all these sort of like, you really have to dig into numbers because everyone, all right, this is a pit peeve. Everyone somehow magically becomes a statistician Yes. Uh, on social media and life. Like it can be quite frustrating for me because, you know, I do statistics of people looking at things like wages for a living. And it's actually very complex. And like whether you're you're choosing the median or the mean, you know, the average or like the midway point, that makes a huge difference. And actually what you you really should be looking at is like distribution, you know, there's always these things like, oh, you know, the average. The average is always gonna be pulled up because you can't for the most part, you can't make negative wages. We we could talk about how you can you can lose a lot more money going to a job where your, your expenses are way higher than what you're making. And yeah, technically that's negative. But on any of these stats, you can't do it. So you're always going to be dragged up if you're looking at averages. And so people always look at that and they're like, oh, the average here is this and it's, you know, whatever. But actually, there's a nuance that needs to go into discussing wages. Like, okay, so maybe your average is this and maybe like, you know, 40% of the people make that. But then you're going to have like 20% who are going to make a lot less. It's like all those, I don't know if you guys, did you guys ever work in call centers or do sales? I did. Heather, yep. Andrew? No, I didn't. But I know, I think I know where you're going with this. Yep. Yeah. They, Heather, then you would have been like, you know, when they signed up, they're like, oh, and, and this is employee like Tony. And Tony, you yes. know, they basically picked the, the, the top employee, their best salesperson, like usually in the entire country, not just your 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 sales office and they're like yeah they, they're making 150 grand or 100 grand right. doing all these sales or oh again it's, it's that the same um, thing with the servers in restaurants yeah. i mean you you can have a server who's making you know 30 dollars an hour even more than that because of the tips plus their wage and where you can have somebody who's making 15 an hour they're just not that great a server or they're not getting the good tables or whatever yeah so yeah. So there's a huge nuance that I think needs to go into that conversation where don't look at the headline figures, look at the distribution. The distribution is incredibly important because though whoever's usually in any of these arguments, someone's trying to sell you something, either trying to sell you that they pay really well, or they're trying to sell you that you're not paid enough. But you really need to look at that distribution and really understand what those numbers are because you're you're just going to be misled and then you're going to get angry. Yeah, it's exactly right. Right. It's, it's an ad meant to make you feel bad and let you down. You're like, Oh, I've made bad choices. I should go work for Panda express. That's the answer to all my problems. Right. And you just fall right into it because I know how that is. Right. Even, even for me, Mr. Successful college professor, right. When I look at those numbers, I'm like, damn, now I do make more than the top tier now. I don't want to brag, but I'm bragging, but I didn't always, it took a long ass time to get there. Right. So, and it's only really, you know, relatively recently that I've been able to go past that in the beginning, I was at the bottom of that tier, you know, even as a full-time college professor, right. That I was right. I was, I think I was, I think I was tier two on the, on, I was tier two on the Panda Express scale. So you know, it, it can be made to make you feel bad. But as you guys are saying, yeah, it depends on averages and the fine print and all that good stuff. So look before you leap. Yeah, I'd also like to look at, you know, what are some good things with this with this posting? The one thing right. I like about it is that it does give a somewhat clear. Now, it it's a good reminder that when you are working for a company that you're asking what are the potential 
opportunities. Where totally. how can I? It's not just about coming in and making money right off the bat. You want to know what are the opportunities for your growth within that company, and be careful how you ask these because you can come across wrong when you do. If you know, I've had people that well, I, I want to know exactly what you're going to do for me, right? And I think it's more of a, a conversation of listen, I'm. I'm really looking to grow professionally. Of course, I need a job, but I would like to grow professionally. And are there opportunities for me to grow within this company? And yeah. so it's just a question, not a do you do. It's not accusatory, I guess. So just making sure that you're asking in a professional way. And then I think having a rubric is important. So, you know, I've created a rubric for the company that I work for. So there's a clear path. These are the expectations of where you are when you enter this stage. So there's several stages and then you look at your career path. This is where I can be. This is where I am right now. And you can see clearly where you fit. What are some things you need to do to progress to the next stage? And it also, as a professional, you shouldn't be looking at, okay, how, what's the quickest path from A to Z? It is what can I collect? What information what skills can I collect along the way? I want as a professional, I want to grow within each section and I want to master that section before I move on to the next section. And think why? Because every time you move on to that next role, which is then a promotion, you're a rookie all over again. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that you are set up for success and that you can grow within that level and then get to that mastery. And then you move on, you're working again, and you just keep up. But that's the healthy growth that you want. It takes time. You're not going to get from A to Z. And if you're only thinking about money, you are going to be only focused on that A to Z path. And you need to look at what's happening in between. So why don't we take that conversation to the next segment? Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. All right. So segment two of Archaeology Podcast, CRM Archaeology Podcast <laughs> episode. You should not have given me this task, Andrew. Episode yeah, just 289. Go forward. Yep. Where we are talking about, you know, is it true? that we're grossly underpaid across the board as archaeologists. Andrew. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we hear this all the time, like, like, you know, people just complain and be like, yes, we are. Yes, we are. So underpaid. So grossly underpaid. So I think in in this segment, we really want to talk about what do we actually make? You know, what is the 
the different levels. And yes, we all know that in a place like California, it's going to be on the high end, you know, and that's so that's OK. If we talk about that, we go, well, in California, it's this. That's right. But what is the, the this thing? So what I'm curious, you know, is, OK, first, what does the very top tier CRM archaeology person make now? I mean, like company owner of like a mid tier company, you know, the highest level, what, what do they make? And then what does the lowest entry level person make? And then finally, what's all that middle stuff? And I, th I think that can be the hardest part, even for us as professional archeologists, like what, what are these various positions? What do they mean? How much do you actually make in the middle realm? So first highest end position, like Heather or Doug, what would you say? What do those people in the stratosphere make in CRM? Okay. So there's different categories even within that. Yeah. You can have the owner of a CRM company, but because I, I think this is important to understand because you, you hear, you see a lot of this conversation on social media where people are complaining about the smaller CRM. In fact, I think yeah. they're many times the ones that are kind of the ones that are guilty of maybe these low hourly rates and the low per diem. Mm -hmm. And so the small CRM companies, I'll tell you, they're not making a whole lot. There are some, I mean, I know there's one down in, in San Diego where he ended up getting a, you know, large contract with San Diego city of San Diego, and he just captured everything. And my understanding is he's now a millionaire. Wow. As, as an archeologist, his own company. However, my understanding is this person did actually do it off the backs of other people. Who, and he was <laughs> charging, you know, and he focused mainly on monitoring. So that's the other thing is that, you know, there's, there's some people that work with me that love monitoring. They love it. Yeah. And there's others that absolutely hate with a passion. So that's another thing you need to think about, but we won't focus on that. But mm -hmm. what is, want to do what kind of work does this company do so you that's like crazy right that that that's right. a lot of work. if you own a company there's always a law there's a, a yeah there's a continuum of what you could potentially make and there's so many different factors so that's there is and and i know i know it's a it's a tough question but i'm just saying like you know so ballpark yeah, just, numbers man ballpark, okay so if you are somebody who let so it's important to understand who you are too when you're looking at what you're going to make potentially. If you are somebody that wants to work, wants to put in the eight hour day, wants to put in a good eight hours, and wants to go home and not think about work and it just put it on the shelf and you're done, right? You can make good decent money, but that's going to make different than you're not going to make as much as somebody who is really is working more than eight hours. And I, I'm just going to give a two yeah. minute little lecture on that. Okay. But then I want hard numbers, man. Yes. Okay. Um, you are, <laughs> you, you are, people have this concept that when you become salary, that it's still 40 yeah. hours, it ain't yeah. 40 hours. No, okay? no, no. That does not count anymore. So anyway, so, but if you're somebody who is imaginative, who is constantly thinking about what can what can be better is working on business development, is working on all components of working a business within a company. So you're not a company owner, but within a company and you are, you're it, you're the director. Yeah. In some companies, you're making several hundred thousand. So, and that matters though. Is it 200,000? Is it 400,000? You know what I mean? Uh, there are people out there that are making north of 400. Yeah. Okay. So I, mean, but I bet you there could be people making more than that, but right. it also means though, that they're, you know, these are the people that are, they're, they're unique. Yes, they are. Yeah. I, and I know that ability yeah. it's about, or not just about desire. It's about a, an ability. They have so much, their skill set is just like any other business. Mm -hmm. They have a unique skill set that, that uh, brings in money and allows them to manage and grow a, a, a company yeah. to be successful or to right. grow a practice within a company to be successful. 
I know what you mean. I, I know it's not just on a spreadsheet where it's like, OK, if you get to level 10, this is what you get. No, right. it kind of depends on who you are as a person, just not everyone can do it. And who you work for and who you yeah, work for and exactly. the amount of money but, that's coming in. Right. Yeah, so, and, and I think both of us know a handful of those people. And, the, and I would agree they would be in that world. So, yes, in CRM, as an archaeologist, you know, you can if you're the right person can get in that multiple you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars world. Yes. OK, yeah. yeah. So then now let's let's look at somebody who's maybe who who's who's very good at what they do, who is maybe a regional mm-hmm. director. Right. So a regional director, I would say you're looking at. OK, in California, it's different. Yeah. yeah. Let's just work with California. Yeah. Okay? And I and then you can scale it down based on other. And, and right. I would say. California and maybe New York areas mm-hmm. where the it's scaled larger. So you're right. looking at above 200. Right. See, so yeah, right. there. And then there we're getting into the like, oh, maybe this is the person on the top scale, you know, and, and yes, you need to have some specific knowledge and stuff. But this th- maybe this is something reachable. And if you're not a superhero, you know what I mean? Right. Um, to push yeah. back though, New York, New York should be higher because of cost of living. But like when you actually look at wages, yeah, East Coast is actually a very terrible place to do archaeology. <laughs> is this New York City? Are we talking about the higher end in engineering firms? What are we talking? Yeah. Like like if you're talking about like wages, so you know, the highest wages for archaeology in the US. Alaska and California. And those are mainly, you know, cost of living reasons for that. Right. You know, very expensive places to live in general across most of the state, most of the, across the entire state. Whereas, you know, certain states, you might have a city where it's very expensive and the rest of the state might be low. But in general, so th- those are our cost of living reasons. And then you look at wages and like basically west of the Mississippi is better than east. And when you when you look at those wages of like New York State or like Pennsylvania, Virginia, again, it's tough because, you know, you, you're doing projects across the entire state. And so you're only getting numbers for like a state. But like, yeah, New York, comparative, like you get paid more in California than New York. New York is actually the wages tend to be for sort of an East Coast. So, you know, smaller states, they'll say like, we're looking for pe- people with experience in the Northeast, you know, like Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania. And yeah, for the most part, they it's it's a rougher deal on the East Coast in like New York. Yeah. But in general, as, as uh, Heather pointed out though, like there's always gonna be exceptions. So like, if you're working for like a large engineering firm, they don't actually tend to some of them will have sort of like that cost of living, but they just pay really high no matter where you live mm-hmm. or where, where you're doing it. It'll be like a, a company's pay scale. And some companies do like, you know, some adjustments, but a lot of companies just can't be bothered. So like, yeah, you know, it's great to work for like Jacobs or, you know, any of the large engineering firms, wherever you you live, especially if you can live like, you know, somewhere in the center with low cost of, of living. But, you know, for the most part, like an average wage is going to be not as great on the East Coast and as on yeah. the West across across all wages, you know, field tech, crew chief, project manager, or, you know, technician three. There's all these different terms. But yeah, for the most part, um, yeah. it, it's a rough deal. What I, what I care about and I want to beat out of all three of us yeah. is actual numbers. Like and if I because if I'm listening to this as like a, a young CRM person or whatever, I'm just getting into it. Where can I reasonably go? Right. And so we've already talked about, okay, there's these superhero rock stars who can get these multi, multi, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's good to know, just to know that that is out there. And then Heather brought up the point of like the regional manager person, hey, maybe 200 grand. That is still obviously something to shoot for. Not everyone can do it, but we're at, that is hey, if I play my cards right, if I do good things, if I get an advanced degree, if I'm a people person, if I have some business sense, you know, maybe I can get, okay, maybe it can top out at 200,000. I also want to point out, we're talking numbers that I don't reach as a college professor. And I want to just say, you know, that yes, I I teach at a community college, but 
whether it's community college, whether it's four year, whatever, our salaries are generally vaguely similar, honestly. So, or, or you get more. Being yes. In college, being in yeah. College, no, that's it's a sweet then. deal. I'm not complaining, yeah. but but yeah. in the grand scheme, just so you guys know, you know, like a fully tenured professor in in that world will top out at maybe one thirty, just in that world you know, maybe 150 or something. Yeah. It, it, again, it depends as it always does, but just so you guys know, right. And I, I don't make 150 as my rate, you know, yet. So just, just to know that's where I am. So when people are like, Oh, uh, academia, the golden route for money. No, not necessarily. If you play your cards, right. CRM, you make more money than academia. Yes. Anyway. So can I, can I come in on that real quick? Cause I think yeah. It's different. It's tough because in a sense, like it's academia is a lot harder to break into. Yeah. Um, so, you know, possibly, you know, there's maybe 100, 120, 150 PhDs in archaeology yes. and each year in the U.S. And there are maybe, you know, between 25 and 50 positions that come up, which might be less as, you know, student mm -hmm. numbers go down. And so, you, you know, you're, you're looking at maybe the odds are roughly, you know, 20, 30, 40% giving on the, you know, certain years are really bad. Like I remember COVID, no one hired. So like there was an entire yeah. year lost there, you know, it, it, right after the great recession, that was a really crappy year to try to get into academia. So like there's that. So like it it's much lower odds of being able to get in. Yes. And your starting pay is not that great. Like I would guess uh starting pay for a full-time professor can it vary so much. I don't know, these days 70 grand. See what I'm saying? <laughs> right? As a full-time assistant professor? Yeah. Yeah, like California. Yeah, which is going to be lower in other states as well. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's one of those things where like there's that and then uh, you know, most, we don't have really good numbers on like how many people will make it through tenure, majority do, to associate professor. And then, you know, some people don't always make it to professorship, but there is right. like, once you get into academia, there's a fairly defined sort of step. A trajectory. And, yeah, there is. Yeah. This is also sort of a complaint that you run into in sort of CRM. And so they're like, you know, Go back to that Panda Express. There's nice levels and stuff. Yeah. That's what um, they were saying. But, like, mm -hmm. but yeah. again, you have to have a rubric. You have to know where you're going, what your path yes. is. And, and that is something that people should be asking when, again, professionally, when they're looking at a job. Not just – sometimes you you get a job because you really have to you, – you just need to make ends meet. But in the grand picture, while you're making ends meet, you need to look at – ask if they have a rubric. Ask if they have – what are the specific levels and what what do those specific levels pay? Yes. And and, and what is required of me? What do I yes. need to get to that next stage? These are all things. Now, you're not there's going to be a lot of companies that do not have this, but the companies you want to work for do have it. And why is that? Not just so that you know where you're going and what you need to get there, but you have people that are in the company that are progressive and they are thinking these things. What do we expect from our employees? And we are putting time and effort into growth of our employees. And, and part of that is having a distinct rubric of what we expect. Because, you know, there's a lot of people that are, that they'll just give you what you're willing to take. Yeah. And, and those are the people that really do not care. I mean, some companies, they get a little nervous when you put something on black and white on paper. <laughs> saying, they if do. you get to this point, you will make this. That makes HR people nervous, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's a clear path. And it's not impossible to find a company that does that. Right. So the problem with that, though, is, and, and this is, so this is something you see across sort of a complaint across all archaeology. And this is, this is something that I think we should, you know, if you're, for listeners really need to, to, and if you're new to the field, you really need to sort of understand is, Archaeology is relatively small. Actually, I'm just going to go back to that Panda Express. It's like, oh, nice levels. Like, here's this. You know, you start off at like 40, and then you can make it up to 100k. Yeah, but then like, you know, Panda Express has like 40,000 employees and only 2,200 stores. So you know, 
there's a about one to 20 ratio to get to that top level. And this is something that, again, if you're in that, that corporate, and I've seen this, you know, I've worked outside of archaeology and, and different things, and what people don't quite understand, and this, this is true of, of almost all jobs, unless you're in some sort of job where there's just, you know, tons upon tons of job opportunities in your city or in your company, or if your company is rapidly growing, you really aren't actually going to have a lot of chances to progress. So like, yeah, oh, it's great if you can make up to 100K, but like at your store, if you're at your Panda Express store, if you have someone who's at 100K and has no no inkling of wanting to quit or maybe only like two or three years older than you, well, you have to basically wait for them to either die or retire. And you run into that a lot in archaeology as well. It's like, even if a company has a really set list of like, these are progression, these are, you know, you're going to go from tech to crew chief to project manager, which has a really defined role instead of the generic, everyone calls it a project manager, up to a PI, up to an office manager, up to, you know, regional manager, up to national, you know, even if they have those steps, likely you're going to have to switch to a different company. At yes, some point. You're always big deal. Be, <laughs> yeah, you're always it, it, gonna have someone above you, and there's not gonna be it's, it's I, gonna be a pyramid. I so did like, that. It, it, it depends. Yeah. It depends on where you work, and yeah. and I, I also want to give a little caution about engineering, and I think we need to take this mm-hmm. to the difference to the next segment. But yeah. I I want to be cautious about engineering companies because not all engineering companies are 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 going to pay you well, right. um, and it also depends on what are you taking on. If you, mm-hmm. you cannot, it's, it's not, you're not going to get the same pay for somebody who is in the field working and their job is done when they're done, when they put the shovel down, they're done. There's a different pay rate for somebody who is actually working in a management position, has a lot more responsibility, who has responsibility for bringing work in to making sure that everybody that's in the field has a job. These are all things that the more that you take on, it's just nuance. The more that you take on, the more money you're going to make. And not everybody, and you have to be realistic about yourself. Not everybody is really want to do that. You have to know, you have to look, and that's what the rubric is good for, is being able to understand what are the things that are going to be expected of me? And is this something I want to do? Is this something that is going to fit with me professionally, with my life dreams? You know, there are some people that, yeah, I mean, you just have different different concepts of what you want to do with your career. Some people want to make their career their life. And some people want to make their life, their career, something that they do in order to enjoy other parts of their life. And so you, you just, you need to be honest with yourself. But one part is you need to be working for a company that at least gives you some kind of understanding of how that progression can go in the context of what you want to do professionally and personally. And I think we should take this to the next segment. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken expert since 1990. Taco expert since now. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Welcome back to segment three of CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 289, where we're talking about, well, we got we got a real heated conversation going, not in a yes. bad way. That's good. That's good. It's, it's an emotional subject. It needs to be talked about. We're going to do our very best 
to get you guys some hard numbers here. We all feel very passionate about this. I actually think that we should probably do a series on this. Yeah, this is an important subject and there's so many misnomers and we have only covered like two of them and there's dozens, but there's a lot. Anyway, Doug, you you had some things that you wanted to address. Yeah. One thing I was going to say, it's going back to those levels and that, again, there's there's maybe like 10,000 archaeologists in the U.S., you know, different years, different estimations. Maybe it's up to 12 in a good year. Bad years, it's down to like seven or eight, you know. But that's like, in terms of those levels and, you know, defined being able to move around a company or move up in a company, I think if there's one thing I can get across to new people in the field is you're most likely going to have to move. Like even even that Panda Express example I'm using, most people to move in those corporate things, you actually have to move to different Panda Express locations to become a manager. Like that's like it's not really talked about. And you know, there's in a big city, you'll have a lot of opportunities. But like I've I've known people that have worked, you know, a lot of the big corporate things, and it is very true. I've I've had people move halfway across country to go take a manager position. So like when they're talking like a, that Panda Express, like, oh, you can make 100,000. Well, yeah, if you're in California, then you might have to actually move out to like, I don't know, Alabama or Wisconsin or Juneau, Alaska to get to that level. And that is the same thing in archaeology, only it's worse because, you know, Panda Express has 40,000 people, 22,000 op- or 2,200 opportunities. You know, they're just that much larger of an organization that much larger of experience and, and opportunities, you are going to have to to really, unless you have luck, and some people do this, some people manage to stay with the same company their entire lives and are quite happy, make decent living, make decent money, and that's great. But in general, for most people, just like how you, you have to move around at the tech level, I think a lot of people have this misconception that like, oh, once I get, you know, project manager, whatever they're calling it, or a PI, that basically they can then just sort of sit and put down roots. But actually, if you are going to be moving through companies or, you know, trying to move up different levels, you know, trying to become like a regional manager or whatever, wherever that that level is or that that set out career trajectory, you're most likely going to have to move or you're going to have to wait until someone above you in that company moves or dies or retires. Hopefully, most people are retiring or moving to a different company and not dying. But, you know, there's there's quite a few people who do that, who just stay till the very end in their archaeology job. And so that's just something to say is like, I think there's this misconception that like once you, you've stopped, you know, once you stop field teching, shovel bombing, whatever you want to call it, that you can just sort of settle down and be able to move up. But archaeology companies are actually very small. Even if you're in part of a large engineering firm, if you're doing something like that and you're moving up in those companies, you may be moving out of archaeology. And this is the same at the fed, federal level as well. There's a, a fairly big complaint among federal archaeologists, uh, same with state archaeologists, is there's not actually a lot of opportunity to basically progress in your career because essentially you're, you're, you're waiting for someone above you to, to leave so you can take their position. Now, you can get lucky. There can be booms, hopefully not bust. And during booms, there might be a lot more opportunities, like your company might grow. But for the most part, you know, the largest, well, okay, now Chronicle's like 800 people, and that was it. But for the longest time, the largest company was like 100 people, which was like SRI, like a decade ago, was only 100. And there's, there's only so many regional managers, so many office, so many PIs that you can put into a company of 100 people. And that's just... That's just the reality of, of these progressions. And it's it's slightly, when you simplify it and do that nice little graph of like, ooh, you're going to progress here, here, and here, it, life doesn't work that way. And actually, sometimes your careers might go up and down and like, you know, the, that step to Panda Express, you might actually go up two steps, go back down a step because there's better opportunities and then shoot up like two steps. So I, I just like to throw that out there. In terms of Andrew's, question about like wages yes numbers Um, numbers acura so it's been about uh, six seven years since i've done the numbers but acura relatively recent so this is going to be a couple years old i think they collected the numbers like either 2021 2022 
So, you know, right before inflation really kicked off. So you should probably add 20% to all of these numbers. And, and there's a range. And what I talked about is like, you know, East Coast, definitely a couple of dollars less. And it gets of better. Of what? Numbers. Numbers. Okay. <laughs> Low end. And this is probably like, so this, again, think of this a couple of years ago. Low end is like $15 an hour for your tech for entry going up to about 30 that that's sort of your range but to be realistic that 15 to 17 range they had about like 20 percent in that i think that's probably down to like nowadays probably you know a quarter your lower end is going to be like 18 to 20 and that's going to be mainly the east coast probably like you know 10 20 percent of people are going to be making 30 or, or more dollars and that's going to be like your california and your Alaska range, but that's 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 sort of your entry. And again, it's a it's a pretty big sort of shift there. Well, actually, not really. It's about ten dollars, but the fifteen dollars or whatever. But that that's it basically. And most people, you know, a couple of years ago, were making about eighteen to twenty. Right. Um, that's that's you know, and, and think about that. That's that's going to differ for different states. But you know, eighteen to twenty is probably going to cover a lot of the of the middle states. So you know. You're sort of Illinois over to like Nevada ish. Yeah. Or maybe not so, Nevada. So yeah. if I'm listening to this, I'm like, okay, I'm new to CRM, like countrywide, really low, like something like $17 an hour, be like, okay, this sucks, you know, but and then up towards 30 bucks an hour in the more expensive states, that kind of thing. That's kind of what I've seen. In my experience, I've seen fairly recently in California, I've seen a lot of like 25 ish world. I've seen an uptick in the last like five years, seven years, you know, something like that. So I used to see a lot of 17s. Now I see a lot of 25s and, and, and up because people, you know, and this is to start in miscellaneous, you know, Acme archeology span firm. So, okay. So we have our, we have our low level. We have our high level. What's the medium level. Yeah. Well, again, also part of that is again, little asterisk there like you know yes, if you but, can work 12 12 months a year that's yes. that is a decent you know that's putting you in about like the 40th percentile in terms yeah. of like wages in the uh the u.s you know not not the highest you know everyone wants to be more but that is actually you know compared to a lot of service jobs that are not in California where you have twenty dollars as a mm-hmm. minimum wage I mean like think about it like some people are still on the federal seven whatever it is you know ridiculous yeah. not great even with yeah so like there's there's that range so it's not bad but it's not it's not gonna be the top and then it, yeah. it, it depends again like you know a good states to be in would be like Arizona. well it depends where in arizona but if you can do arizona new mexico colorado like those mountain west states are paying that like you know 20 dollars yeah. or so with good cost of living and then you know your crew chief add two to four dollars on top of that so if you're a crew chief you're, you're making a little bit more maybe five dollars you know inflation it's sort of it's starting to spread out a little bit more and then it really again heavily varies you if you make that jump up to like the office you're, you're potentially adding like another ten ten dollars fifteen twenty to get where so you're you're in the office and actually heather I know you want to jump in on this. So let's let's take that. You're in the office. You're kind of a full time employee. You know, you're you're on that level. You're not hourly like like uh, you're mid you're kind of mid range. What is that range? So in I would say the mid range. And I guess this is going to be salaried. This is something it's a job where you're salaried. You're getting benefits. This is not someone who's as needed and who's you know, doing field work. And then sometimes they're getting, they're getting the opportunity to do writing tasks and other things inside the office. So you're, you know, you're at, I think the low, and again, I don't really know anything about the mid air, you know, the mid section of the country Mm -hmm. in the Midwest. I really don't know what they're making there. I think it would be a good idea to look at it, but I'm, so let's say for California, you're in your staff, quote unquote, staff archaeologist. What does that mean? Staff archaeologist, you're you're somebody who's taking on writing tasks. You're doing writing sections. You are not writing. Some some companies you are <laughs> writing from start to finish a a report, but you are writing primarily writing. You are going out in the field, so you have maybe a fifty fifty. You have fifty in the office, fifty in the field, and you're making about between sixty 
to 80,000 yeah. in California for somebody like that. So this is, what does that look like? I have already been in the field. I've already worked. I've already have some years under my belt for field. You probably have some, t- some years, a couple of years under your belt doing crew, crew work. Maybe you've had a faster trajectory because you've worked on a lot of projects for a larger company. And that just means you have more experience. Experience yeah. doesn't just mean years of experience. Experience means like when I'm looking at a resume, I'm not just, I'm not looking at their years of experience. I'm looking at what did they do? What is the, you know, what kind of work have they done? You know, we have people that come in, I've been working for 15 years, but you know right. what they've done? They've managed one client, like a large electric company, let's say, and they've done yeah. all of their cookie cutter reports. And that's all they did for 15 years. That's not somebody that's going to give me the same capabilities and it's nothing against them, but they're not going to give me the same capabilities of somebody who's worked 15 years and they've worked at a environmental planning firm, let's say, and they have worked on all sorts of projects, supported all sorts of projects, all sorts of types of reports in various different parts of the California and the surrounding states. And their, their 15 years is going to mean a lot more to me than some like the, the previous mm-hmm. example I gave. So, so anyway, you got between 60 and 80 for, yeah. for somebody yeah. who's got about, you know, five to eight years experience, yeah, that sounds pretty much like what I've heard, too. You know what I mean? In that world of stuff. And what would yeah. that person be called? So that's I'm so yeah. glad that you <laughs> brought that up. <laughs> so there are please be careful because I've you know, in my career, I've had companies come and ask me to, you know, you know, they're trying to recruit you. So mm-hmm. they try to give you a lower pay, but then they give you the title of the lofty title of senior archaeologist. Ooh, tell me more. <laughs> senior archaeologist for one company is completely different than a senior archaeologist in another company. So do not get swayed by titles and don't even look at t- in when you're looking at a t- at titles and even these mid to senior level. I mean, like I was reading right before we are going to start this. I'm looking at you know, what they're expecting from mid mid to senior level. I mean, it's so all over the place. Mm -hmm. So for mid to, when I'm thinking mid to senior level, that's not just they've been working for eight years or 10 years or whatever. Mid to senior level, I'm looking at, these are the tasks that I need a mid to senior level person to do. And do they have enough experience to either they've already done it and they're, they're ready they're already done. They can just shift over horizontally or they have enough skills that they can be trained into that level. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking at. So, you know, and then principal investigator, right? You say principal investigator for some people, principal investigator only means I didn't use principal investigator as a title until very recently when I just needed to say I was a principal investigator because that's what the lead agency requires you to call yourself. Right. So, when I email people, it depends. I change my signature block. It just depends on what I'm looking at. I read the room professionally. Yeah, and I that's say, super okay. smart. I just want to break in for a second and say, like, what yeah. a smart little thing to do. Change your signature, you know, for yeah. those groups, because they'll see that and they'll go, oh, you're the person. Right. And sometimes, yeah. you know, I'm the cultural practice director for a company. Right. So I'm the director. I'm the the top person for archaeology for the company I work for. Sometimes I might actually put that in my block. It depends. Sometimes the client needs to know they're they're working with the director, and sometimes that's not a smart thing to add. So I'll Hmm. just put principal investigator Mm -hmm. because let's say I'm working with the lead agency and I'm just going to put down that this is what they need. This is let's say a NEPA project. They need that language of principal investigator. What does that mean? Or sometimes you even say SOI qualified because what one person calls principal investigator is not what the the other person calls. So it's, you have to understand also, if you say you're a principal investigator, anybody who comes out with an MA out of graduate school or a PhD out of graduate school with zero experience, or I shouldn't say zero, zero experience at the professional level right? Of managing and everything. And maybe they've worked for a couple of years. They've monitored, right? They can actually say they're SOI qualified. They can actually say they're a principal investigator. They can sign on a report. Are they qualified or capable of writing a full report? Nope. 
Yeah. But they can call themselves a principal investigator. So don't get hung up on the titles. Yeah. You have to know what, and that's where it's important. And you need to, you know, like you're not always going to be able to have the ability to work for a company that has a rubric because few do. And some of them don't even have correct ones, but you do want to have at least a company that's working in that direction or aim to, to work for a company that is putting some time and effort into quantifying, qualifying these roles. Yeah. You know, I got one, one last question. I know we're like over time, but it's like, so we've done the like kind of 30 to 60 K a year sort of thing being entry level. We kind of had 60 to 80, which is what we've just been talking about on the flip side. We had the super high end. My last question is if I wanted to make like six figures, if I wanted to make like a hundred grand a year, like, like what, what do I do in CRM? Where, where does that put me? Good, good question. Um, yeah. Good question. You change jobs. No, 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 no. In yeah, seriousness. That's, always, and that's a strategy. No, 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 that's yeah. a strategy. Sorry. Well, I think, yeah. Sorry. And when I say change jobs, not as like you change out of archaeology, but like as in you, if you're wanting to do that, yeah, you, you're looking at the jobs. You, you, you're constantly keeping an eye out for, for what's out there. Of course. And I don't know if we have enough time to cover this in that last two minutes, but like there's, there's a lot of strategies there, but you are, no, but you, you're moving. I just want to know use. what I'm aiming. Like, what is that entail? What is that job? And I, I understand I'm going to move around. Are you talking like a hundred thousand, like California dollars i'm talking, talking i just want to break 100k you know i want i want to see that that the irs sees that i make 110 a year a year or something like that so yeah like heather like what, what's that last so you know 100 there's a huge variety uh, mm -hmm. a huge yeah. between 100 and i'd say 175 right right so if you just want to break that 100,000 i do yes you could in california you could break that 100,000 by somebody who is a lower level project manager. Okay. Yeah. So you're right. a project right. manager, which means right. you are in charge of a project, several projects, but mm -hmm. for one project, what does that mean? That means that you are taking that project from start to finish. Yeah. Whether you're doing it and, and that means you're managing everybody that is a part of getting that final product out the door. Yeah. You are also part of, providing services after that product is out the door. What does that yeah. mean? That means you're dealing with the lead agency. You're dealing with questions that happen from tribes. So that would be, you're breaking that hundred thousand. You know, depending on the company, you also still might be out there like leading field work as well. If you're yeah. do well, of course, if you're do, let's say it depends on yeah. what kind of field work, not a survey, like every no, now and then no. you're going to put somebody out there for, for that. But I'm, for data recovery, of course, yeah, you need yeah. somebody yes. there. There are many instances, many environments where you must have that principal investigator that the lead agency trusts is taking it from start to finish. They have to be on site. In mm -hmm. fact, I just had one where I was working from the truck, writing the report while the crew was <laughs> working because I had to be on site or they would not allow it to happen. Right. So Yes, you're right. You are going to uh, might always be in the field. And I think that's a good thing. People mm -hmm. need to oh, they need to always keep their feet in the field. Otherwise, they lose their perspective. I think no matter what level you need to have some kind of field experience over the year. I truly believe that now. Totally. If you there is another echelon in there like that's over the 100,000 that's going yeah. up to like 120. Right. Yeah. Now you have something where you are not only managing your own projects, but you are overseeing people who are managing projects. Okay. What's that called? So that, I, uh, it's I not, know. Yeah. There's it's no really ask the hard questions. questions. That would be maybe a senior project manager. There right? you go. Not, okay. And this is just a, you know, or a regional build. manager or an yeah. office. So I wouldn't call manager, it a regional manager. Yeah. It depends yeah. on what kind of, yeah, it depends definitely. On the company. It depends on, on the, the size company. of it. Right. Yeah. yeah but again, like, it's, yeah. For, it, I'll tell you how many different, how many different titles? This is how you know how many different titles there are in this business. Yeah. yeah. Go in to and find out how many CRM companies exist in California. Let's say it's 80 CRM companies. You have 80 different titles. You totally <laughs> I mean, do. Yeah. It's, See, that's, that's why that's, that's, that was my. It's probably about like 120. Like, yeah. Right. Some of those companies will have multiple titles. Yeah. They're the going to. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. I'm, not, I'm talking about 
you have 80 titles for that same level is what I'm saying. I, right. And I'm exaggerating it's, a little bit. No, but, but you're yeah, not. I don't think you are. We you're all not. get the joke. Like, like yeah. that's what I wanted. That's what I cared about. My yeah. third of this podcast. I was like, I want to know, okay, what do people make? And what are the levels? Right. And I know it's a terrible question because there's so much variety. So there I is, think but that's senior, I think it's a fair question. The senior yeah. level project manager. Now, senior level project manager is managing other people who are managing projects. What right. does that mean? That means you are reviewing projects, deliverables. That means you are training people to, you're training people up. You are looking in the big picture. You are trying to make sure that you have a team that can handle the work. You need to, you need to manage the in and outflow of work. You need to hire people. You need, you're also doing business development. I mean, there's right. Right. But you're doing it maybe on a smaller scale than the people above you mm -hmm. in levels. And that is going to bring you between 130 and 180. Okay. In California, 130, yes. 175, right? We've, That's going to bring yeah. you back. We've closed then, the like, traverse. Well, then the rest of it, because like it's such a huge range. Like, so I've, I've just, I've just done some quick calculations to adjust. So these are based off of, you know, real job postings, real amounts. But like, if you're looking at that sort of mid-level, that, that project manager, you know, taking projects all the way through, like the range is between like 35,000 and 135,000. Like across, 35 grand across sounds across brutally country. low. Yeah. You're talking across the oh, country. Yeah, no, it, it's, yeah, but that's the thing is like, it's a bit tough, but like, yeah, wages are so variable across the country that like, you could seriously be making a lot more as a field tech than someone that has a ton more responsibility than you do. And that could be even in the same state as well. Yeah. Like, I just, and, I just think it's you, such you a huge yourself, range. Again, I think we're falling into is, are there outliers where you're making exactly terribly low money? Yeah. Yes. But there's nobody I'm t there is. It's a difference between somebody who worked for a small CRM firm and somebody who works for a, a larger environmental firm and the amount of pressure that is coming, like, I'm, I'm just telling you, it's a completely different experience and, and it requires a completely different set of skills mm -hmm. and mindsets in your mind and your and willingness to work. It's very different. So to call somebody a senior project manager because they have one or two or th maybe they have 10 projects, not even, yeah, 10 projects over, over yeah. a year's time in a small CRM company, that is a that's so different. Let, just to give you a perspective, the last company I was at, I was basically involved and like intimately involved in 70 projects at one time. No joke. That's so, a lot. And, and I was involved in that many, I would say maybe take it down to 50. So I would at one point at any time in the year have 50 different projects that I, ha I was involved in. And that, and at, you know, several years ago, that was the case several years ago. So that's very different than somebody who's working for a small CRM firm and has a few projects. So yeah, yeah. It, it's, there's so many, so complex. If we could say is you can't like, I know what you're asking there, Andrew, I guess like if you were to yes. put the range in there, like the mid manager would be like between like 50 and, and 70 across the U S is, 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 is more typical than those extremes, but it, it's so variable and it's, but in terms of work and in terms of pay that like, of course, I, I think it's understood not very though. defined that you could just say like, Oh, you're going to take these steps to get here. Yeah. Cause again, a lot of it, like to make the money, you might just look out and it might actually have nothing to do with your archeological skills. It has more to do with your business skills. Yes. Something we've touched and, on a lot, you yes, know, that yeah. people, that so, people in archeology span classically suck at. Right. But, you, uh, cannot, yeah. you cannot expect this is, this is the, if, if you, and I, I want to end with this. You absolutely can make good money in archaeology. You can. But yes. You do and must have a business acumen. And it does not mean that you have to be gifted with business knowledge. It means that you are pursuing that, that aspect of this business. You must look at it from a business perspective. Or you won't make money in this. So it's not just about putting the years in. People say, I've got 30 years behind my belt. Yes, but you're, you've been doing the same thing for 30 years. Are you able to 
to identify things really well in one region of the, or in multiple re- regions of this country. Yes, that's great. But mm-hmm. you aren't generating wealth. Yeah. You're not generating business right. development. You're not, right. you're not doing it. And so that is where the money comes. And that's not a sellout. You can be no. both. I consider myself a business person and an archaeologist. Exactly. Look at you. That's exactly. It's like that's what we preach forever and ever. And this is what I mean. What Heather said is like, yeah, I, I think this is also you can make good money in archaeology, and this is applicable to pretty much everything. Like, yeah, I you know everyone's always like, oh, lawyers and doctors. I know lawyers and doctors who actually make less than archaeologists. You know, there's there's more averages and distributions, and it's more likely that you're going to make money. But like any profession, you can make money in. At any profession, you can live at below poverty wages. There's 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 different factors that affect that, and it's not necessarily the factors that some of it's luck, and some of it, most of it, has to do with your business acumen, not necessarily right. your archaeological skills. I think we all between us figured out basically five positions in CRM. It was basically a, a tech, which I would say is from thirty to sixty k a sort of mid-level manager or supervisor kind of person, which is about 60 to 80, project manager from 80 to around 120, senior project manager from around 120 to 175, and owner at 175 and above. Does that sound owner basically or, right? Or owner or uh, senior manager. Oh, senior owner or senior manager, manager. yes. 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 I, I like, also like that. Senior project manager. It's yes, different. senior senior it's manager. Career, like director or yeah. regional director, that kind right. of thing, yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Huge asterisks on the owner, because you know you can you can owners could be making you know several hundred thousand. Yes, but I just wanted you know. Or they could be making fifty. Yes, exactly. Twenty. I mean, you could be losing money. Like as an owner, you you can lose money. It's a bigger gamble. It's a much bigger gamble. So you can actually be that. That's actually one place where you can. I know I said you can actually have negative wages, but really, as an an owner, yeah, you you can end up bankrupt and with negative wages. Well, that that's easily. because you had lots of people that go into into archaeology thinking they can go on their own because they want to have the flexibility of having their own business, and it starts growing, and they're let's say a DBE. A disadvantaged business enterprise and so they're getting some maybe federal contracts and but they've never been told the business side of things so if you are interested in going into your own business just a little word of advice um, from me take it for what it's worth make sure that you get some some experience from a business perspective either you've gotten it somewhere outside the world in other aspects or you have worked for a larger company and then decide to go on your own but don't do it straight out of graduate school that's for the most part a mistake in my opinion. Anyway, so thanks for listening all. Hopefully the extra time was worth it to get some hard numbers. Andrew, thank you. I think so. Yes. <laughs> On track and making sure that we actually did give you hard numbers and I want hard numbers. Yes. And, you know, I think we are going to be doing some follow up podcasts on this, but at least it wets the whistle and, and gives everybody some broad ranges to work from. So thank right. you, everybody, for listening and we'll see you next time. See you guys later. Bye, everyone. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archpodnet.com slash podcast. Please comment and share anywhere you see the show. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Support the show and the network at archpodnet.com slash members. Get some swag and extra content while you're there. Send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Thanks to everyone for joining this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.